Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam ala Rasulullah. I hope to be able to prove to any rational person, any right thinking human being, that not only that there is a God who has created all of us and sustains the universe in which we exist, but also that God has sent to human beings guidance through which and by which we can live our lives, earn His pleasure in this life and the next. Now for many people the whole idea that you could prove a religion to be true is a strange idea. For many people religion they imagine is supposed to be something mysterious, incomprehensible. In fact the whole idea of faith in the minds of some people is that faith is supposed to be something that you believe without any proof. But Muslims don't hold that point of view. Rather for us faith is something that is established upon evidence, upon understanding, with insight. In the same way for example that a scientist has a theory and that theory is supposed to be supported by evidence through observation of reality. So by observing reality, by observing the world, by observing various phenomena, the scientist comes to a conclusion based upon that observation. Now, before we start our conversation, I have to lay down a few fundamental points. Some issues that we all have to agree on. If we don't agree on these issues, you can turn off the TV now because there's not going to be any point in this discussion if we don't agree on a few basic fundamentals. So the first basic fundamental that we have to agree on is this, that the world in which we live and this universe in which we live is real. It is real. It's really there. It's not like in the film The Matrix, you know, is that uh, everybody in their mind, it's a computer generated image in their mind and maybe reality is not reality anymore. I mean, okay, it's possible that that could be true. But what does it benefit us thinking like that? Now we have to accept that the world in which we live is real. I am real, you are real, the sun is real, the trees are real, the air is real, and this is a real world. And the way we understand our world and the way we understand ourselves is by observation and by using our minds. This is the way that we understand reality. This is the way that we make sense of our everyday lives. We use our minds, we think, uh, we reason, and all human beings have something in common. There is something in common that makes us all human beings. There are certain physical features we have, but there are also certain mental features and ways of perceiving reality that we share. That's common to our humanity. So one of these things is what we call common sense. We can call it common sense or the ability to reason. And there are certain things that we all agree upon. And no two human beings would differ except that if that person differed about this, we'd say, that guy's crazy, that guy's mad. He doesn't, you know, his brain isn't working properly. So one of the things we all, for example, let's take an example. One of the things that we all agree about is this, that the part of something, part of something is less than the whole of a thing. Part of something is less than the whole of the thing. We all agree with that? I'm sure we all agree with that. That's something every single human being everywhere is not going to argue about it. Okay. Another thing that all human beings can agree, agree about, to give another example of something that we can all agree about, is that we don't find something coming from nothing. We don't find that. Human beings understand that where we see things working according to laws, working according to patterns, uh, we see things constructed, we know that thing has come from somewhere. How did this universe come into existence? Where did we come from? What is the origin of all of this universe? If we can think about this and we can understand this and we can reason this, then we will find step by step we will come to an amazing inevitable conclusion. So let's look at our universe. Let's look at the world in which we live. Let's look at ourselves. What we find when we observe the universe, when we observe ourselves, and we observe the world around us, we find that things are not only working according to laws, 
and they're working according to systems and patterns. But these laws and these systems and patterns are amazing in their intricacy and their detail. And there are so many examples of this that are evident. Imagine instead of the earth rotating on its axis once every 24 hours, imagine instead that the earth was rotating very, very slowly. And in fact, a day was not a day, but it was what is now equivalent of 30 or 40 years. So what would you find? You would find that one part of the earth's surface would be almost constantly exposed to the sun. The other part of the earth's surface would be in darkness. The consequence of that would be one side of the earth would be superheated, the other would be super cool. It would not be possible for life to exist. If there was not an ozone layer protecting us from the harmful effects of the sun's radiation, life on the earth would not exist. Could this perfect combination of gases, of movement, of various aspects, and I've just mentioned a few, be a product of some random event, of chance and coincidence? Let us, in order to understand this, go back and use what we decided already we're going to use. Let's use our process of reason. Let's use our common human experience. Is there anything in our human experience that tells us that you get such order, such fine and precise order from some random event? No. Our universal human experience tells us that where we see something working according to orders, a working according to patterns, someone or something has ordered it. Someone or something made it work according to those laws and work according to those patterns. That's why, for example, an archaeologist could go and dig in the desert and find a simple piece of pottery, just a simple piece of pottery. Yet this archaeologist will be able to tell us so many things about the civilization that made that piece of pottery without ever seeing them. He didn't see them make the pottery, he didn't see their houses, he didn't see their buildings, but this man digs in the dirt, he finds this piece of pottery, and he will tell us so many things about this civilization. Their state of technology, their transportation system, their level of intellectual capacity. Because he can examine the pottery, he can tell us at what temperature the ovens must have been at in order to bake the clay to get it at this uh, certain texture. And therefore from that he can deduce so many things. So for this archaeologist, the existence of this piece of pottery is conclusive proof of the existence of the people and the intelligence and the civilization that made it. If I was to say, for example, my mobile phone here, what is this mobile phone made of? Essentially, what is it made of? Two things, silicon, which is sand, and plastic, which is oil. So here we have silicon and plastic and a bit, of, a bit of leather is the cover of it. So two things, silicon and plastic. Now, in what place in the world is there lots of sand and lots of oil? Well, for example, Saudi Arabia. There's lots of sand and lots of oil in Saudi Arabia. What if I told you I was walking along one day in the desert in Saudi Arabia, and here I found this mobile phone, a product of complete chance and coincidence, random events. The oil spewed, the sun shined, the sun shone, lightning struck. And after millions and millions of years of all these geological changes and, and the heat and the cold and the pressure and, and the wind blowing, uh, this mobile phone came into existence through mere random processes. I'd say this is ridiculous. Yet the human mind, the human brain, is infinitely more complex than a mobile phone, than even the world's fastest supercomputers. The human brain is infinitely more complex and has a, a huge capacity for computing power beyond what any human being has been able to make so far in terms of computers. It's an amazingly sophisticated machine. And in fact, with all the organs of our body, can we really believe? Is there anything in the totality of human experience that leads us to believe that these things are a product of some random event? No. Human experience tells us, reason tells us that when we find something ordered, it is a product of an intelligence that has ordered it, made it work according to these laws and these patterns.
So we look at our universe, we look at ourselves, we look at our world and we ask. Three simple questions. Did it come from nothing? That's the first question. Did it come from nothing? Did this universe come from nothing? Did we come from nothing? Do we find anything coming from nothing? No. There is nothing in our human experience to lead us to believe that something, let alone something so complex, could have come from nothing. So that's not a possibility. The second possibility. Did it create itself? Did this universe create itself? Did we create ourselves? No. If we did not exist in the first place, how could we have bought or how could this universe bought itself into existence? If it wasn't there, how could it make itself there? And we don't attribute to the universe and to the things in the universe the ability to create. What is the universe made of? The universe is made of stars and galaxies. Lots of stars and lots of galaxies. Do the stars and galaxies have the ability to create? Do we attribute to them the ability to order things? No. In fact, they themselves are in need of being ordered and they themselves are in need of a creator. And if something is not able to create or organize on its own, then a large collection of them cannot also make something like that happen. It's that simple. It doesn't matter how many you bring, they still lack that ability to do something. So the same with the universe. The universe could not have created itself. It couldn't have ordered itself because that's not an attribute of the universe. Rather, it is in need of something to create it. Are we the creators of it? Human beings? No. Because we ourselves need a creator. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion of the rational mind is this. That this universe needs a creator. It needs an organizer. We need something. We need some explanation of how this universe came to be and how we came to be the way we are. And therefore it makes sense that there is something outside of this universe, different from it, separate from it, that has organized and created and that sustains this universe in which we live. So the creator. The creator is different and distinct from the creation. The creation is needy. The creation is temporary. The creation is in need of a sustainer. Whereas the nature of the creator must be different. If the nature of the creator is not different, if the, in other words, if the creator is of the same nature as the creation, then that creator would need a creator. And if that creator was not different, then that creator would need a creator. And what you would have is creator creating creators ad infinitum. So this question, well, okay, I recognize the logic and I recognize the reason behind the existence of a creator, but then who created the creator? It's not a valid question because the nature of the creator is different. The nature of the creator is eternal. The nature of the creator is infinite. The creator is without beginning and without end. The creator is self-sufficient, ever-living. So an ever-living, self-sufficient, eternal being does not need a creator because that being is ever-living and self-sufficient. Let's think about this in another way. Why the existence of such a being is logically and rationally necessary. Let's give an example. If I am here, or you imagine yourselves at home, and you have a big table, or you have some big cupboard, and you want to lift it, and you want to move it from one place to the other. You're not able to do that on your own. You're not able to do that on your own. So what you want to do is you want to enlist the help of someone. So you go to your next door neighbor and you say, listen, I want to move this cupboard. Can you give me a hand? And your neighbor says, listen, I'll give you a hand, but only if my friend gives me a hand. So that other person says, yeah, yeah, I will give you a hand, but only if someone else gives me a hand. And imagine everybody makes that condition. Everybody says, I will only help if somebody else helps. If everybody along the line makes that condition, will your cupboard ever be lifted? Will your furniture ever be moved? No, because everyone is saying, I will not help unless someone else helps. So if you have a creator, creating a creator, creating a creator, 
you get the situation where nothing ever gets created. Just as your cupboard never gets moved, nothing ever gets created. But the creation is here. I'm sitting here, you're sitting there, look out of the window, you'll see the sun, you'll see the moon, you'll see the stars, you'll see the trees. The creation is here. That means that something has been created. So you can't have creators creating creators ad infinitum. There must be somewhere where it stops. And it has to stop at a being who is distinct and separate and different in his nature from that which he created. Now, it is hard to imagine. Reason cannot really accept that there could be two eternal, infinite, self sufficient beings, let alone three, four, or five. So the nature of this creation indicates to us that if there was more than one creator, there would not be a creation, there would be chaos. But rather the underlying unity and the intricacy and detail that we find existing in this universe indicates to us that there must be one united, wise, powerful and intelligent force behind all of this. So here's our discussion. Here's our reasoning. Here's our step by step, stage by stage process of reasoning that we have gone through. And what have we reached at the end of it? What we have reached at the end of all of this is a simple conclusion. This universe has a creator. This creator is different from the universe. The creator is wise. The creator is powerful. And there is only one such creator. Out of all the religions in this world, of all the philosophies and the religions and the ideologies in this world, which one teaches us to believe in one creator who is eternal, who is self-sufficient, who is infinite, wise and powerful, and who is different and distinct from the creation? you will find that although many religions and philosophies have some aspect of this idea, nearly all of them compromise it in one way or another. For example, let us take broadly the Hindu concept of God. The Hindu concept of God, for example, and I use this in a very generalized sense because I do realize that Many different people within Hinduism have many different beliefs. But generally, the Hindu concept of God is that the creation is God. God is everywhere and in everything. So this is the idea, what we call it, pantheism. That everything is God and God is everywhere and in everything. But this contradicts reason. This contradicts our whole process that we have used it. If you think back upon what I said, how can the creation be the same as God? And if the creation is the same as God, then what created it? The whole rational basis that we used in order to understand that God exists falls on its face. So the idea that God and the creation is one and the same is not acceptable. It, it's not rational. It can't be understood by reason. There's no basis for such a concept and for such a belief. And then you find other religions, for example, Christianity. By and large, most Christians believe that Jesus was God. But traditional Christian theology tells us also that Jesus was the manifestation of God. In fact, many religions claim that God manifested himself as a human being or some type of creature. Again, this compromises that basic belief. How can something be creator and created at the same time? How can something be both eternal and infinite and finite and temporary. How can something be self-sufficient and needy at the same time? It's like saying the square became a circle but was still a square. How can a square become a circle and still stay a square? It doesn't make any sense. It's irrational, it's illogical. It's enough reason to reject any religion that tells us God became a man or God became some type of creature because it's irrational. It doesn't make any sense and it's something you can never ever prove. You can believe it if you want to, but you can never prove it because it's a commonsensical, rational impossibility. And whatever is a rational impossibility can never be proven. It's that simple.
So what religion is there in the world? What religion tells us to believe in one God that is wise, self-sufficient, powerful, who has created this universe and sustains it? Well, you're reduced to very few religions. Perhaps the only two religions that teach such a clear concept of the one God is Judaism and Islam. Well, if you want to become a Jew, by and large, Orthodox Jews will tell you tough. Because if you want to become a Jew, you have to be born a Jew. Your mother has to be a Jewish woman for you to be a Jew. So what universal religion, what, uni what religion that is universal, that is there for every person, that invites every person to believe in this rational, simple, clear, commonsensical belief is left. Look to the Qur'an. Open the Qur'an, read the Qur'an, read about Islam, and see for yourself the concept of God that the Qur'an teaches. There is a chapter of the Qur'an called Surat Al-Ikhlas, the chapter of this purity of faith. It describes this concept of God so beautifully. It says, Kul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. Say he is Allah, the one. Allahu samad. That means Allah is the one which every single thing needs, but Allah is in need of no thing. So he is self-sufficient, in need of nothing, but everything needs him. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. And he does not give birth, he is not the begetter. Rather, he is the creator. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوَانَ had, And there is nothing that can be likened unto him. God does, is not like anything we can imagine. Whatever picture you can put into your mind, God is not like that. God is unique. God is different from this creation. And this is the beautiful, clear, rational teaching of Islam about God. And in fact, I would say, for any right-thinking, rational human being who uses their process of reasoning, that is reason enough and that is proof enough to show that Islam and the Qur'an is from the Creator of the heavens and the earth. May Allah guide you and may Allah guide me and all of us closer to the truth. I hope I will be able to continue to show you in the next episode some more evidences and some more convincing reasons why the Qur'an and why Islam is the divine revelation from the Creator of the heavens and the earth. Until that time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, may God's peace and blessings be upon all of you.